Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lectures one through three in our lecture series, we introduced the idea of group actions. That is, we have a set for which some group G is acting upon it. Uh, this, this is often referred to as a G set. Okay, where X could be any set, it might have some algebraic structure, it might not. All that we're assuming right now is that there is a group acting upon that set X. And in those lectures, we presented many, many examples and some properties of group actions. Uh, in this lecture four, we're going to talk about the so-called class equation, which when you first look at the class equation, it actually feels like a somewhat obvious observation. But believe it or not, this obvious observation can actually have some powerful consequences, especially in the case of P groups, which we'll talk about in the second half of lecture four, the next video here. Uh, but we'll introduce the class equation in this video right here and look at some examples. So let me remind you about some notation we introduced previously when we discussed uh, group actions. So there's the idea of a stable set. So if you have an element G that belongs to the group, and the set X sub G, capital X representing the G set here, this is the collection of all elements X inside of X, such that G dot X is equal to X. So this is the stable set. These are all the things that were fixed by the element G itself. Uh, related to this, on the other side, uh, there's the so-called stabilizer. That is, uh, there's lots of different notations, of course, for the stabilizer. Uh, the one that we're mostly using is this, is this, uh, this set G sub X here. This is the set of all elements G inside of the group such that G dot X is equal to X, right? So the important thing here is X sub G is a subset of X and G sub X is actually a subgroup of G, which kind of makes sense since X is a set that may or may not have any structure besides that in fact it's a G set, then X sub G is just a subset. Uh, but the subsets of G, we don't really care about really, we care about subgroups. We have these stable sets, these stabilizers, sometimes called the isotropy subgroups. Uh, what we wanna do is add to this collection of symbols here. And so we're gonna consider now the symbol X sub G. So notice what's going on here, that X sub little G, this is a subset of X, and then the subscript then tells us how we construct that. So for a little element, who gets fi uh, who gets fixed by the little element, the individual element X right there, then capital G sub X here, right? In that situation, um, we're taking a subset, a subgroup, in fact, of G that's determined, that's fixed uh, with regard to this element X right here. Now we're going to take capital X sub capital G. This is actually very similar to this set right here. We're gonna take the subset of X, right? So X sub G is the collection of all elements of X. So this will be a subset of X right here. But what's different now is that we wanna find all those elements X that are fixed by G, but in fact, they're fixed by every G whatsoever. So now the capital G is suggesting here that the little g is allowed to vary, right? In this notation, x sub g here, the little g is fixed, but the capital X is allowed to vary. You can take on any element of X so long as it's fixed here. So now we allow X and G to vary. And so this gives us all of the elements in X that are fixed by everything. These are things that are trivialized by the group action. No group element does anything to them whatsoever. So in fact, this right here is the intersection of all of these sets, X, G, as G is allowed to range over the elements of the group. So this would be the collection of all of the, uh, it's the intersection of all the stable sets. It's a very important set when one studies um, group actions. Another way of characterizing it is the following. Um, XG here is then the union of all of the orbits sub X that have this format. Each orbit is just a singleton because after all, each element of the group just sends X back to itself. So its orbit is going to be trivial. So this is, this is, uh, this stable set is all of the stable sets uh, together. I should say it's all the it's all it's the intersection of stable sets. It's the union of all these trivial orbits. Uh, this is this is the collection of all of the trivial elements of the group action. Okay, of, of the G set here. And so, since the orbits of a group action form a partition, because after all, uh, the action does 
cause and equivalence relation on the set. So X is a union of all of these, uh, all of these cells here. So X, you know, you're gonna have maybe a couple elements that are trivial. X two, move it up. Um, in which case we have some like X K, right? Uh, and then you're gonna get a bunch of orbits. You have some orbit here of like X. Uh, K1, another orbit here, X, K2, or something, you know, just keep on going. X is the union of all of these things. Now, the trivial orbits we can put together as this set X sub G, uh, like so, and then the other non-trivial orbits, we just keep them as they are. Because X is a union of all those things, we get the so-called class equation, where a G set can be partitioned into... Um, it's orbits where you take all of the uh, you take all of the trivial orbits. We're just going to glue them together for simplicity's sakes, and then you have these non-trivial orbits right here. Um, it's important to mention that with a G set, uh, the orbits are essentially the G subsets. That is, the orbits are kind of like subgroups in that the orbits of X are going to be those subsets which are closed under the group action. If you take an orbit x here and you times it by any element of the sub uh, of the group right you act on it you're just going to get back the same orbit like things might get scrambled up but you're going to get back the same orbit so the the orbits of a g set kind of are like the subgroups if you think about it in an algebraic category sense in which case then uh, of course you can union co these would be sort of like the smallest cosets uh, the smallest uh, sub subgroups so to speak um you can take unions of orbits that will also give you g subsets and one important one of course to take the union of all the trivial ones right this is the trivial subset of x there and so you get this this very important equation it's called it's often called the class equation for which the cardinality of x here is going to be the cardinality we'll call it the order i guess the order of the trivial um stable set there and then the union the sum of the orders of all of these orbits here. Now, when it comes to group actions, there's one group action that's very important compared to any others, and this is the conjugation one. I mean, there's a lot of important group actions, but the group action of conjugation is very, very important. And why is that? Well, the group action of conjugation is a group acting upon itself in an algebraic manner. And so any information we can learn about the G set uh, actually says something about the group itself. So this is a group action that actually tells us information about the group itself. We learn things algebraically by studying a group as a group action. And so oftentimes when we talk about the conjugation uh, action, we can inherit sort of special terminology, special notation to describe uh, the symbols we saw on the previous screen just for the group action, okay? So in particular, the orbits of the group action with respect to conjugation are called the conjugation classes. Uh, a notation that's often used in this situation is that if you want to take the, conjug the conjugation class of X, an element X here, this is often denoted as X to the G. So this would be the collection of all elements of the form G inverse XG, where X uh, is fixed here, and so G is allowed to vary here. Now, technically I'm writing this as a right conjugation, um, we really should be working with left conjugation because we made the decision to do left actions in this lecture series. But the thing is, the action, um, the left action by conjugation and the right action by conjugation give you the exact same partition um, of consciousness classes. It doesn't really matter because if you are right conjugating by an element G, then you're left conjugating actually by its inverse. So you really get the same thing. No big deal. We're not going to be too worried about that. So this notation here suggests what you're doing here is you're taking the element and you raise it to the G. Why the superscript? Well, this is a very common thing because this notation can be a little bit cumbersome at times. So oftentimes in group theory, we use exponents where you take X to the G here, and this represents G inverse X G. For which, if you want to be somewhat, you know, conventional with what we're doing here, you can put that on the on the right. In practice, though, when people write x to the g, they mean the right conjugate. Um, if you want the left conjugate, that should be uh, it should be g to the uh, the the superscript should be on the left. Again, that that's how it's typically done in the literature. This is a pain to type up in LaTeX, so it's not used very common. So I think honestly, that's one of the reasons why uh, the right 
uh, conjugations used more commonly in the literature. But despite our agreement to do left actions, uh, the right conjugation action, like I said, is really not any different, so it's not a big deal. Uh, so you might see notation like this used by me, x to the g to represent conjugates. If you mess up and switch it from the right to the left, not a big deal. It won't make much of a difference in this situation. So that's what this notation here means, x to the g. The capital G means that you're allowing the exponent to vary, thus the conjugates vary, but who's getting conjugate is left fixed. And this gives you your conjugation action. All right, the conjugation, excuse me, the conjugation classes with respect to the conjugation action. Knowing the conjugacy classes of a group is very important when you study that non-abelian group. They're trivial for abelian groups, of course. Um, the isotropy subgroups are the stabilizers, will commonly be referred to as C of X. Uh, some people like to call this C sub X, right? Um, now, this, of course, agrees with the notation we had before of G sub X, right? Um, but again, like I said, this is often, often referred to as C of X because, again, since the group that's acting on the set X are actually the same thing, you get a little bit confused when you see th things like G sub X versus X sub G because the G's and the X's are the same thing um, for conjugation. So we introduced that new symbol. So again, it's typically just called C sub X or C of X right here. It's the centralizer. So we're looking for all elements of the group for which they commute with the element X. This is always a subgroup. And this is a subgroup that always contains, of course, the cyclic subgroup generated by X because X will commute with itself. And in fact, every power of X will commute with itself right? And so the centralizer always contains the cyclic subgroup generated by X. It will also always contain the center of the group because those commute with everything. Um, and, and that gives us the centralizer subgroups, a very important group, a subgroup when we're studying uh, non-abelian groups. Now, speaking of this subgroup ZG, the center, um, it's important to consider the center when you're talking about the conjugation action. So again, the center is the, the set of all elements that commute with everything in the group. Um, with regard to these, this discussion of stable sets, the center is this set X sub G, right? X sub G, G, which we saw on the previous slide, this is the collection of all elements X inside the set that are trivialized by the action. So these are all the elements G dot Z, which are equal to Z, but the group action here is conjugation. So we're looking for all those elements G, Z, G inverse, which are equal to Z, which is of course equivalent to saying that G, Z equals uh, Z, G. Like so, it, these are things that commute with everything. So this stable set is in fact the center. Now the class equation, when we translate it to the language of conjugacy classes, and honestly, when people talk about the class equation, this is usually what they're meaning. They're talking about the conjugacy class equations, because uh, the more general formula 1421, which we saw on the previous slide, you might call that the orbit equation, right? But the conjugacy, the class equation, the conjugacy class equation tells you that any group um, is going to have the form. The order of the group is going to be the order of its center plus the indices of each of the conjugacy classes. Let me unravel that for a second, okay? Um, on the previous slide, we saw that a G set X, it's, its order, which now that we have the conjugation action here, the, the X set is itself the group G. Uh, so the cardinality there is gonna equal the order of the, of the center, which for the previous equation, that is we take the collection of the size of all of the elements which are trivialized by the action. That's the center in this situation, which is a normal subgroup. Then we take the sum of all the sizes of orbits. Well, or the, we saw previously by the fundamental counting principle that the size of an orbit is actually the index of its isotropy subgroup, which in the context of conjugation, the isotropy subgroups are the centralizers of the element itself. That is the stabilizers with respect to conjugation are the centralizers. And so putting all that together, we get this right here. And so what this tells us is that the order of a group is equal to the order of its center plus uh, the collection of indices of centralizers where these X's, these XI's range over the non-trivial conjugacy classes. And for a finite group, this observation is very, very important. And we can use this to study various things. You know, so for example, since the conjugacy class has cardinality equal to its index, right? So if we take the conjugacy class of X here, this is gonna equal G dot the centralizer of X. 
which for a finite group, this is the order of G divided by the order of its centralizer. Um, and so this is sort of like a Lagrange theorem-like result. The size of a consciousy class must divide the order of the group in a finite setting. Let's look at two examples of this. Again, it only makes sense to really look at non-abelian groups because this observation is trivial for abelian groups because in that case, you just get that G is equal to its center. It doesn't really tell you much at all, okay? So let's look at the smallest non-abelian group possible. Let's take S3. The consciousy classes of S3 turn out to be the identity, the, the three cycles, and the two cycles. This is actually a general principle that in Sn, the consciousy classes are exactly the cycle types. So if we want to talk about the consciousy classes of S4, we just have to look at the, the, the cycle types. You could have one, you could have a two cycle, you could have a three cycle, uh, you can have a two, two cycle. And that's it. Those th There's going to be four consciousy classes in S4, and it comes from the different cycle types. I don't want to list all of them because there's 24 elements in S4. Uh, we see that same thing for S3. We get three, we get three cycle types, and those are the three consciousy classes. Also in Sn, um, for S3 and above, uh, S4, et cetera, the center is actually trivial in that situation. So we get that the symmetric group, again, for S3 and larger, it's a centerless group that the... the, the Center is trivial in that situation. For S2, of course, it's abelian, so it's, that's not true in that case. So if you look at these together, so the center is just this one. This is the only trivial consciousy class for permutations of, of three letters or more. And so when we look at the class equation, we're going to get the order of S3. It's going to be the order of its center. S, let me write S3 there. Uh, plus, you're going to get the size of that first consciousy class, uh, this one right here, and then you're going to get the size of the next consciousy class, which you see right here. Um, and then, if, so basically what we're saying here is if you add together the sizes of these consciousy classes, you have a conjugate size one, two, and three. And so you're going to get that six has, uh, the order of S3 is six because it's one plus two plus three. And in each and every case, these have to be divisors of the order. Three divides six, two divides six, one divides six. The consciousy class the, equa the class equation guarantees this. Now, for six, that's not too surprising. Six is a perfect number. It is literally the sum of its divisors, one plus two plus three. Um, so that might seem like, oh, you got me there. You had a perfect number. Give me 28. We can do the same thing again. Uh, well, okay, let's try D4. The constancy classes of D4 are the following. One and R2 are central elements. Their collection together is ZD4. Uh, the other elements, you have R and R cubed are conjugates, S and R squared S are conjugates, and R S and R cubed S are conjugates. So we get these consciousy classes. Let's throw the center together like so. And so the class equation tells us that the order of D4 is going to be the order, the order of the center plus the sizes of the three other consciousy classes. So this one, this one, and this one. So you get that 8 is 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. Um, for which we see that those have to all be divisors of eight. So in particular, they're all twos. So two divides eight. Uh, the individual consciousness classes are also one. So those, those singleton ones, right? So the order of a consciousness class always divides uh, the order of the group. And then the sum of all the consciousness classes has to add up to the order of the group. So what we're telling you here is that the group has to be a sum of its divisors, the order of the group has to be a sum of its divisors, which again, that doesn't seem much because you can always just take one plus one plus one, et cetera, right? And to get up to your group order there because uh, one divides everything. But that's just an abelian group. If all of your consciousness classes are trivial, you get an abelian group. For non-abelian groups, it gets a little bit more sticky. Like how can I form consciousness classes? The consciousness classes have to divide the order of the group. Um, and we have to add them all up to give you the order of the group itself. So in some respect, consciousness classes kind of behave like subgroups, at least from a Lagrange theorem point of view.